I remember a story that a friend of mine told me in high school. Lived in Southern California and with regularity, wildfires would come through the the foothills of, of Southern California. There's been some devastating ones in recent years, but that was kind of part of my part of my childhood and adolescence was was kind of the summer fires and fire had broken out in his neighborhood and he was telling me with excitement and a bit of boast how they were trying to evacuate his family but he ran to the neighbor's yard grabbed a hose mm-hmm. and got in the line this is a young young man not a man a, it's a, a high school kid and he gets in the line to join the firefight and even just hearing the story something in me was just stirred by it you know i like i want to be that i want to do that i, I want to be that guy i want to be the guy that runs and it's such a beautiful picture of masculinity in action courage bravery living in a larger story sacrifice on behalf of others Welcome to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. John Eldridge, Morgan Snyder, picking up a conversation we began last time on initiating boys. And as we mentioned last time in our introduction, a conversation that is so applicable to all stages of life because we are all in the process of being formed, right? We're all in the process of being developed. Dallas's little phrase was, we are in training for reigning. And everyone is, men, women, boys, girls, adolescents. And, and so we think that this will be really helpful to all of you as you think about how God is initiating you even now, how he is shaping us as men and women who can handle his kingdom and handle the things that are before us. So last time to catch you up, we were talking about the difference of initiating boys and adolescents we were talking about the difference between process and ceremony to begin with and, and how ceremonies and mile markers are very important. They're very significant. But what we're really focused on is a process over time by which the boy and, and the adolescent are shaped into a really good man. And we were talking about the difference in boyhood, laying the foundation of affection, laying the foundation of belovedness, so that when the adversity comes, it's not wounding. And we were talking about appropriate testing and just handling the boy's heart well when you reminded me after we shut the microphones off of a story that I had completely forgotten. So I was a young man, and we were in your kitchen, and we were working on a project, and your boys are going crazy, these three little boys, and one screaming, and... We hear violence, <laughs> and, and Blaine runs down into the kitchen crying, you know, Sam's beating on me. And, and as a young man, this was just all so formative. And I remember, John, you got down on your knees, and you got eye to eye with Sam, who is your oldest, and everyone's all hyped up, right? And you just waited. There was a kind of an awkward pause, brought the room down, and, and you look Samuel in the eye, and And you said, son, God has made you strong. Pause. And then you said, do you think that God has given you that strength to protect your brothers or to harm them? John, I mean, I remember that day today. That was over 20 years ago. And what it sealed in my heart as a man looking to be initiated and then also to initiate my son is this critical distinction that you drew on that day between the person, the identity that's longing for love and validation, and then the behavior that needs to be addressed, right? He's a young boy and he needs to learn whacking on his brother all the time is not okay. But you made a very clear distinction and I'm so aware that we misunderstand that distinction. And so often part of the behavior management and the discipline actually goes against identity. And so it erodes and even assaults identity, which the boy needs to take this journey. Right. We are parenting the heart. 
we are always parenting the heart more than we are parenting the behavior. And I had to do some honest business with my own heart as a parent to realize that so much of my motivation to get my kids in line, particularly on Sunday mornings, right, (laughs) was simply what other people think of me as a parent. It had absolutely nothing to do with the hearts of my children. It was totally built around impressions and and what others would say. And I had, I had a lot of repenting to do around that because this is about the heart. And here's the good news, gang. I know, I know. As we push into some of these principles, ideas, examples, stories, you know, there's a, it's messy out there. And there's good stories and bad stories. Let me just offer you reassurance. Love covers a multitude of sins. And Stacy and I clung to that truth in the years of parenting our, our children, our, our three sons. Love covers a multitude of sins. It's not about getting it right every single time, always. We make mistakes. I wish I handled it that well in that example that you gave. Every time I haven't, I can tell stories of my anger against Samuel when I was not living well. Love covers a multitude of sins. And when the culture is love, mm-hmm. when the climate is safety— I live in a safe home. My parents love me. I'm safe in love. (laughs) Then correction and lessons learned. And as we were saying, adversity, then adversity becomes, you know, this incredible tool. And this quote by Roosevelt that I absolutely love, the boy who is going to make a great man must not make up his mind merely to overcome a thousand obstacles, but to win in spite of of a thousand repulses and defeats. Mm. That, that overcoming, yes. building that strength, r- building resilience yes. into boys so that as the larger challenges of young manhood come, and I think that they should come, mm-hmm. and I think you set them up to come. You know, it's, we were talking about appropriate testing, appropriate adventures in the boyhood stage so that we could get to the young man stage. And, we are a canoeing family. We absolutely adore being on water. And, you know, we've got this tradition of canoeing every summer. And, and there, was, there was a process there where the first time that they got to be in the canoe as pilot was on a lake. Mm-hmm. Was on a, it was a little lake. It was a pond, you know, with safety. And it was age appropriate. And then they grew from being able to do that. The next step was you get to be in the bow of the canoe while an adult is in the rear, but you're needed in the bow and your strength is needed and you're paddling and we're, we're counting on mm-hmm. you to help us navigate now a river to the final stage where you, you're now the captain. You are now in charge of a canoe and you have passengers. You have people's lives that are in your hands. That kind of progression is, is just a, that's just a beautiful analogy for boyhood to adolescence to young manhood. You're yes. increasing the workload and, and the type of work, you're increasing the type of adventure, mm-hmm. you're setting up the testing. He needs to know he's loved, and he needs to know that he has what it takes. How does a boy discover that he has what it takes? Well, you can tell him, and telling him matters, but discovering for himself that he does is just huge. Yes. Right? And the, the drill thing you were telling me about, you know— Tools when they were young, and or when Joshua was young, and tools now. Right? Oh, right. His confidence. Well, I confess, John, after our last podcast, you told the story of being 12 and giving the reins, and you were given the reins to the tractor by your grandpa. And there was something of just the ache and longing in my own heart and thinking of my sons. You know, we don't have a farm. And, and then I felt like the father reminded me, this is what he's up to. He's author, and he mm. is setting up the initiation uniquely right. for our sons. Yeah. And so then I thought about my son's story, and I remembered he had to be two or three, and we bought his first dresser at Goodwill, and we wanted to refinish it and paint it to match his room. And so he's about two, two and a half, and he's holding our drill. We're drilling holes for some hardware, but... It's my hands holding his hands. And so dad's doing most of the work. But make no mistake, something's being formed in him. 
him and forged by the intimacy, the affection of a yes. father and getting his hands on something powerful, knowing that he's not on his own. And it's tending to the soul. And so now fast forward and Joshua turned 14 and he asked for a framing nailer and an air compressor for his birthday <laughs> because we just finished doing a framing job this year. And I never would have thought. Yeah. That's where the story would go. But it's <clears throat> age-appropriate exposure to, to risk, to danger, mm. to challenge. But th- that's what we're talking about, right, is two-year-old with a drill where he, he is participating, yes. but he's not in control. Yes, yes. And, and so much of the message is, I believe in you, mm. you can handle this, yes. right? I believe in you, you can handle this. That story with my grandfather and the tractor was built on years of me being with him Mm -hmm. on the tractor Mm -hmm. and being around it. It wasn't, that wasn't a first time experience. I watched him do it. I got to sit on his lap as a younger boy. You know, there's a graduated experience here. So John, we're talking about kind of this transition from the boy to the adolescent. And one of the things that's helpful to me in being mindful that, that God is orchestrating this, to ask the question, what is God up to in the initiation of my son? Because before when I got into this, it was all pressure and out of fear, a pressure of, I have to turn this boy into a man. In other words, I have to take him on some sort of path to become what I haven't. That's what the soul's story would have been. And now the shift is, God, you are passionate and affectionately joy-filled about initiating Mm -hmm. my son. And so it causes me to say, how do I become a student of my son's heart? and observe God's story of setting up initiation for my son. And so an example is organized sports are just a huge part of my son's initiation. I wish that it were not so. Were I to write the story of my son, that wouldn't be part of the framework. I'll just confess, I'm not interested. And part of that, frankly, comes out of my wounding, a reaction to my wounding. But as I have been a student of my son's heart, I'm aware that's a primary place of his initiation. And so being a student, going into that, praying about it and saying, God, how do I participate? How do I fuel it? How do I put healthy boundaries on it? You know, I'm meeting with one of his coaches this afternoon to um, have a tough conversation because of pressure he's putting on my son because my son's really talented, but lacrosse is not the biggest story in our world. It's a small part of his larger initiation, right? And so even walking through my son with that, the successes and the failures. And so I think as we talk about adolescence and growing challenges, it's important for me to think, what is the nature of my son uniquely? What is God after? What is his frontier? How do I set it up particularly for him? This is really huge because I know parents are listening and, and saying, yeah, but my son's not like that. He doesn't, he doesn't want to work or, or he, he doesn't like adventure. You know? And I have some failures here. Uh, you know, Samuel loved computers and loved video games, and I didn't. And I didn't like that. And there was there was a message. And gosh, I remember there was some disciplinary moment with um, Stace and I and Samuel in his adolescence. And he looked at us and he says, yeah, well, I feel like the issue is I love computers and you and mom don't like them and don't want me to be on them. Mm-hmm. And it was like, oof, I have missed my son's heart. I have wanted him to be like me mm. or or be like I think he ought to be. Instead of saying, this is who he is, how do I help shape him in his journey? Joseph Nicolosi wrote on gender formation in young men and, and how gender identity you know, gets harmed in young men. And he talked about kitchen window boys. And they're, they're the shy boys, the, the sensitive boys, that when the other kids are playing out in the street, they're watching from the kitchen window. Mm. And it would be tempting to mishandle that boy's heart in two ways. Either one, the rough dad who says, you just get out there and, and you know, get at it. You need to learn how to be a man. And he's not ready for that. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't want to. Part of him wants to. Yes. But he's not sure that he can. So that would be one error. The other error is the protective parent that simply keeps him indoors and therefore just plays into his softness and his fears and doesn't help him grow and yes. develop. You have to ask God, and this is such a great thing to pray 
ask God for the keys to your kids' hearts, boys and girls. Ask God for the keys. What is operating in my son right now? One of our sons was a very, very sensitive child. Lots of tears, lots of emotions. And again, it would have been very easy to mishandle that in a, quote, wild at heart culture where we're doing a lot of adventures as a family and outdoors and, you know, jumping off the roof and and just all that crazy stuff. It would have been very easy to mow right over that. But to be attentive to, oh, this is a sensitive child. He wants to grow. He wants to try. He wants to win. He wants to succeed. Mm -hmm. But you've got to set it up appropriate to who they are yes. and where they are. You don't jump straight into mountaineering. You know, you, you've got to start with the walk to the park. Yes. Right? Where you explore the butterflies and he they get to pick up sticks and, you know, just simple, simple stuff. Right. You, you've got to back it up to who they are and direct it into their world. But I do think that there is a time that comes. So here in, in part two, we're kind of talking about the shift into adolescence. This was true for all three of our sons. You've watched it with Joshua. There is an age, and it takes place somewhere between 11, 12, 13, where the boy is really becoming a young man. Mm -hmm. There's strength emerging in him. There's daring. There's independence. There's a little bit of pulling away from mom and dad and generating and developing his, his separate identity. And he is really crying out for initiation. I think we need to get very deliberate in those years. Mm -hmm. I think that the boyhood years are super significant, but this transition time, and this is when most cultures, whether it was different Native American tribes uh, or Aboriginal tribes in Australia, different cultures in Hawaii, other indigenous cultures really saw this adolescent transition, right? 11, 12, 13, somewhere right in there, the boy is really crying out for intervention. And a lot of that may be his acting out. Um, what you're encountering as a stubbornness and, and an obstinacy and the slamming of doors yes. and the refusal to you know do homework and cooperate is actually the signal, okay, okay, now it's time to get more serious about his initiation. Mm-hmm. And so we set up within our our culture something that we called the vision quest, and we designated it in, in a one year framework. But it, it it can be more than that. But we chose a year to say you know there's a beginning and an end to this, and you are now on your vision quest. And that was a that's a title drawn from Native American tribes. Here, the young boys would go out on a vision quest, and we built the vision quest around several principles. Always belovedness. The first thing we did on the 12th birthday or on the 13th birthday as the year began was just a trip that was something they love to do. They love baseball. We're going to take a trip to a baseball stadium they've always wanted to go to and we're going to watch a couple games. You know, if they love to ski, we're going to go skiing. If, you know, if they love movies, we're just going to do a whole movie thing. Belovedness, but then setting up some very intentional processes by which challenges are presented for identity to be formed and for obstacles to be overcome. And, as you were pointing out, for failure to be handled in the loving context and interpreted. Yeah, it's huge. Because if failure is interpreted well, failure is a no, really huge. great teacher, mm-hmm. right? It's when failure is not interpreted for the boy that he's just left with the message of, you suck, you yeah, can't you handle life. Takes. So wanted to describe a little bit more about that. But first, let me say, you're, you are in that. Yes. And you have like three or four basic questions. Yep that you're guiding Joshua through. What are those questions? Yeah. Even before I get to those questions, I think what I'd say, John, is as you're describing that, as soon as you name Vision Quest and this year and this trip, I find a reaction to want to take notes and write it down and say, oh, there's the formula, right? Right. And I just want to pause and say that thing to default to a script or even structure mostly comes out of the unfinished places in me. Right. I, I just want to say, we are not laying out the specific roadmap for every boy. So having said that, yes, like John, I sense God asking for part of Joshua's initiation to involve a vision quest. And what my sense was that there were four fundamental questions. And these are things I'm carrying for him. Mm-hmm. This is not all on him. No, not at all. Right. But there are these four questions of the masculine soul of 
who am I really? Who am I as a man? And who am I uniquely that God's made me to be? Who is God? What What is he like? Mm-hmm. The third question is, what is the story? What is the nature of reality? What, what, is, what is the truth of what we find ourselves in? And then the fourth is, what is my frontier? As I've sat with these categories of initiation for over two decades okay, so now. So just repeat that again so folks. Yeah, so these, who am I? these four questions have just become a framework that are deeply helpful. Who am I? Who is God? What is the story? And what is my frontier? Mm-hmm. And the and one of the litmus tests for those four questions is, do they apply to me today as a 42-year-old man who is more finished than my son and yet still deeply unfinished? And those questions are absolutely relevant yep. and real time for me today. But what's important is that's my responsibility to carry that process for my son and in time and over time to allow his discovery of the foundation of the answers to those questions in his initiation process. Yeah. Now, folks, I'm going to say a couple defining things that I just think are universally true. I think most of that takes place through physical experiences, and I think much of it takes place outdoors. And if you're going to fight against that, I just want to point out a couple things. When God created Adam and Eve, he didn't put them at the mall. He put them in creation. Creation, nature, the world around you, is literally the world you were made to live in. And the fact that we spend 93% of our time indoors now is an absolute tragedy and explains much Mm -hmm. of why people's souls aren't formed, much of why character is lacking in the world today. Because nature is where we learn our lessons. There's just so many beautiful things. And one of the big lessons you learn is there is a way things work. You know, you rub your hand against the wood this way, you're going to get a splinter. You rub it this way, you're not. You know, you turn that canoe sideways in a current, it's going to flip. You point it down river, you're going to be okay. There's, there is a way things work to every single thing in, in the natural world. Very little initiation takes place online. Very little initiation takes place with technology. So I am going to set those parameters yeah. and say whether or not you're an, quote, outdoor family You know, there's always a park nearby. There's always water. There's always something that can be accessed there. John, one other thing I would add to that that's an important framework for me is much of the initiation happens in the dailies. Yeah. Right. We try to separate it to be this formal thing, again, out of our unfinished places. And ceremonies are important. And big milestone, the the baseball trip's really important. But so often it's the daily, um, interpretation to go every day God is setting up a thousand small opportunities for initiation. I I, I mentioned that I I have to sit down with one of Joshua's coaches uh, today. And last night, you know, Joshua and I grabbed some camp chairs and sat outside and I just said, tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what would be helpful to you in this conversation. Now, I know some things that I'm ready to share and ask, Mm -hmm. but to bring him into the process. But it's about what he's passionate about right now and what where his struggle is right now. But it's in the mundane, over meals, in car rides to school, where that shift from boy to adolescence, I notice I have to start asking more questions. Yeah. But they do thrive with structure, and they do thrive when they know certain things are going on. Mm -hmm. So here's our first camping trip. That's huge. You get to put up the tent. Yep. Right? Here's your first flat tire. You're going to change it. Here, You know, they do love it when we're saying these are moments that that we are focusing on. Right. So we, we would build a Vision Quest year in our case, and there were physical challenges, and there were emotional and spiritual things. So they had to learn the larger story. They had they would read the book Epic and they needed to learn the four acts. And that was kind of what is the Christianity you're teaching mm-hmm. them? What is the story you're inviting them into? Stories are absolutely huge. We would go into their favorite movies, uh, whether you know it was the Star Wars, right, or or the Lord of the Rings or whatever it was, and point out the larger story. And then they would need to tell it to our community. There was an evening where they would get up front and they would tell the gospel. Like, here's what I believe to be true about who God is and what the story is we're living in. And they would use their movie in their film clips to, to show that. So that was, a, that was a spiritual thing. There was a day 
where we would practice hearing the voice of God, and that was something that was totally built into their childhood and growing up. But then there was a day Mm -hmm. where they would fast, and they would go out, supervised. I was somewhere in the vicinity, in the woods, but we would go into nature, and they would spend a day listening to God on a couple basic questions, and they were questions of identity. You know, God, do you love me, and do I have what it takes? And Letting God speak into, you know, give him a journal, and it it's an awkward thing to go spend hours with God. Most people don't know how to do that, and it, it's meant to be awkward. The initiation process is awkwardness that requires you to rise up, Yes, right? So, there were spiritual things like that, teaching them spiritual warfare and not always handling their fight for them, but saying, you tell fear to leave, Right. You tell shame to leave and, and rather than asking mom and dad to pray for you or to do it for you, right? So there were spiritual things like that. There were physical things. And for each of us, the culmination of the vision quest was always a big mountain climb. And we kind of set this one thing as – because you've got to have parentheses around mm-hmm. it. It's got it's to have some framework. Absolutely. You know? So, but the story of Lane's climb, we we were climbing uh, something called the Prow down here in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. It's a thousand foot – multi-pitch rock climb and we did it with another dad and his sons because it was better to do it that way safer to do it that way but i was also trying to arrange it i brought another friend of ours who is a much better climber and mountaineer than i am and then it was it was the night of we were laying all the gear out and realizing we had to climb in two teams and suddenly i realized i have to lead the first team because my friend who's the more skilled climber needed to lead the other team mm-hmm. of less skilled and suddenly I'm driving out there and I'm like who's being initiated on this mm. Jesus and he's just laughing because he's like oh yeah this is all about you you are being initiated while this whole process is going and on that's all so good that's right so good and even so good for your son Right, to, for him to see you model that you're not saying, I've arrived. Yes. You're saying we are both sons being fathered. Yes. I mean, one of the things, yeah, John, I, that story reminds me of how often, if you ask Joshua, he will say that I say, son, I have never fathered a 14-year-old before. This is my first time. Yeah. And I used to look at that as weakness. Now I look at it as strength of I'm learning alongside. And so I just love that it was added to Blaine's initiation that you were consenting. We're all being shaped. It's beautiful. We're all being shaped, yeah. So we would build this year around, you know, challenges and trips and then work, hard work, Mm -hmm. and teaching them, you know, the skill of hard work. You can can help install this bathroom floor that molded and rotted out you you are now part of the community that yeah. contributes right and so you're going to stack hay bales i remember this like oh father this one time the neighbor down the road had this huge huge stack of of hay bales cuz they feed hay all winter to the cattle and it had fallen over we're talking hundreds and hundreds of hay bales it had been stacked improperly and the whole thing had come down and he gave me a pair of leather gloves and he pointed me down the road, and he said, you go help that fella. Mm. He didn't come. He sent me down it's there. Beautiful. I was so pissed. I was, you know, the adolescent is right. necessarily going to love all this, right? So but what to, did it do? I'm so curious. Okay, you go from leather gloves, what the hell, I'm going by myself, <laughs> Yes. to the end of the day. What was its effect on you? End of the day was so good because it was humility. Mm. And the fellow that I was working with was kind of a rough character. He was he was not all soft and initiating and lovey dovey, you know. He he was but at the end of the day it's that firm handshake and you did well. Thank you for your help. And just that thing of thank you for your help. Yes. I can help. You brought a strength to this man. I can make a difference. I can contribute. That's just huge, 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 huge. I love it. We had a group of guys that were helping Bart fix some fence during Samuel's initiation year, and I'm looking for these opportunities. Right. So I just grabbed it. Yep. And I, I said, Blaine and Luke, you can't come on this particular day. This is Sam's, and it, it's part of his year. And we get out there, to, and it's hand Sam the power tools and say, you do this part, right? It's that confidence. I believe in you. I trust you. Rise up and hard work and how shaping that is for the masculine soul. So good, John. A couple other pieces in giving it structure. So the heart's journey having structure for Joshua's vision quest, one of the 
the helpful physical pieces was a board we put up on his room. So it's pretty simple, but I made it. And like a bulletin board? Yeah, it's like a, a, a bulletin board, a wood frame, four by eight sheet though. So it's big. Yeah. And the idea is there are stories competing for his affection, right? And I remember in high school, girls and drinking were big stories, Right. They held my affection. And as I look back in my 40s, I go, well, they were the biggest stories I knew, the biggest adventure, the biggest risk, the biggest validation. Right. There was no one shepherding a larger story. And so one of the those four questions I named earlier, one of the senses from God is, what is the largest story his reality that gives context for every other story in his life? So like when you said – Each of your sons had to present the story of the gospel to community. It gives a framework to say every other story we find unfolding in our days, our school, our friendship, our sports, our activities, find their context in this. So Joshua has a really big board, and it was intentionally presented empty. It just says Vision Quest. And over time, we fill it with what we've named initiation badges. And so they're physical expressions of moments of celebration. It's not about performance, and it's not about victory. Mm -hmm. You know, he has one for suffering when he Mm -hmm. had to get his appendix out. So he has an appendectomy. I couldn't manufacture that. I couldn't time that. But I saw it as a moment Mm -hmm. of God's initiation. And he had to fast for almost 20 24 hours and he had to go under, you know, anesthesia and he handled it with great bravery. And so giving that surgery a context for his initiation. So he has a suffering badge and a picture of him, you know, on the table looking vulnerable, brotherhood badges, the, his seeing his first counselor, a badge, hard work badges of working on framing a house. Mm. And, and over time, his room is taking shape under this umbrella of initiation, yeah. and, and it does some powerful things in his soul. Yeah. So, uh, again, just some context. There's process and ceremony. There's moments you arrange for and moments you just seize. <laughs> you just seize mm-hmm. the opportunity, right? There's, there's a lifetime of initiation, but then there's a year. There is, there is this shift. In the adolescent, man, something is really crying out for active engagement and putting some brackets around that and saying, hey, we're going to do this for six months or 12 months or two years or whatever. This is what we're doing. And then building into that emotional, spiritual, physical testing whereby those two things go deeper and deeper. You know, I love you. I absolutely adore you, and you have what it takes. You are the real deal. You have a genuine strength to offer the world. Coming up to, and then, yes, the ceremony. For all three of our sons, we know we would have the men in the community over for an evening. Well, the whole community, but then the men would get up and speak, and they would say things to the young man of, here's who I see you are. And each of them had been involved in one of the experiences. Mm -hmm. So, hey, when we were on that backpacking trip, here's what I saw in you, you know. And hey, when we were on that work day, that service project, helping someone fix their house, here's what I saw in you. And then especially words from mom Mm -hmm. of who she sees the young man is, and then words from the father before the community. It's so powerful. Words from the dad, and then we would bestow a sword as a like an archetypal symbol of you are a warrior, you have strength, you have courage, you have bravery on behalf of others. And then in our particular context, that was also the year they got their shotgun Mm -hmm. and they could come, that was their first year they could come bird hunting with the men. So, you know, here is a weapon you can handle. Now that's going to stay in dad's gun safe, not in your bedroom, but you can handle this and you get to come with the guys now when we go pheasant hunting. But the idea being there's gifts bestowed, there's words bestowed, and then there's prayers of blessing and benediction and the community blessing the young man and welcoming the young man into kind of the community of men and and speaking and blessing, praying over them. Very, very powerful because it was built on 13 years yes, yes. of all kinds of experiences, right? And pointing it out in their favorite movies and all the different opportunities that arise. And then a very structured experience, one year in our case, at the end of which that ceremony meant a lot, mm. right? And they knew they'd earned it. It wasn't just freebies. It was like, no, this, I worked hard for yes, this yes. and I earned this and therefore that benediction. And then as they went on, 
I think we'll pick up next time just some thoughts on initiating older teenagers Mm -hmm. in in indie young manhood because, yeah, there is the high school graduation. There is the first girlfriend and how you handle that. There is the first car or motorcycle or transportation and whatever that looks like. And and so the the initiation process continues. And, you know, Morgan and I are being initiated every week. Yes. You know, so it's... uh, it's a process God has committed to in every person's life. We hope you found these categories helpful and that there's a broader application to every human being on the process. We are being shaped in our own training. You've been listening to the Ransom Heart Podcast with John Eldridge and Morgan Snyder. 